Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for a virtual excursion in the Marin Headlands and over to Tennessee Valley. My name is Jesse. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications at Greenbelt Alliance. And for those of you who aren't familiar with our work, our mission is to educate, advocate, and collaborate to ensure the Bay Area's lands and communities are resilient to a changing climate. The work we do to protect the Bay Area's natural and agricultural lands while also creating thriving communities as well as free as well as this free outings program is made possible by you. So please donate today, which you can do so securely on our website at greenbelt.org forward slash donate. And with that, I'll hand it over to Ken, the fabulous leader of our outings program. Take it away, Ken. Okay, well. Here at Greenbelt Alliance, many of you go on our outings, our actual on, on the uh, on the ground outings. We try to have an outing nearly every week, somewhere in the nine county Bay Area. And one of our most popular outings is uh, to the Marin Headlands. In the springtime, we generally have a wildflower walk led by David Schmidt, who is a uh, uh, environmental historian and his wife, Serena Anger, they lead a wildflower hike in the headlands. In the fall, we have an outing in Tennessee Valley. And usually sometimes sandwiched in between the summer, we have a, a rock to look at the, a walk to look at the rocks in the Marin headlands and sometimes a doggy walk. And every once in a while, we'll uh, combine the two, which is interesting. I think the, the dogs have a great interest in geology. But today we're going to do a, a try to do a little virtual walk, some of the background of the Marin Headlands. And the first human, I don't know too much about the settlements. I don't know that any um, shell mounds or mittens have, have been found. We know it was uh, uh, probably seasonal use by, by the coast Miwok. We know a lot more about the first European to own this land. In 1822, uh, English whaling ship, the Orion, there it is, sailed into Yerba Buena Bay. And the ship was badly in need of supplies and repairs. And the captain lined everybody up on the deck and he asked, who speaks Spanish? Because of course, the job would be to go to the Presidio and talk to the Comandante. And of all the crewmen, only one raised their hand. That was William Richardson, who was the first officer. So we left the ship and the Comandante was so happy to see him and to talk to somebody new that uh, held a party in Richardson's honor that evening at the Presidio. And there's William Richardson. This is uh, much later in life, a very distinguished looking picture. And at that party, Richardson appeared and so did the Comandante's daughter, Maria. And their eyes met and it was love at first sight. Now I'm guessing that back in the day, Richardson looked more like this, more like, Arrow Flynn and Captain Blood. He just swept Maria off her feet. And Maria probably looked a bit like Olivia de Havilland. Anyway, they were determined to marry, you know, possibly because Richardson hadn't seen another woman in six months and, and uh, Maria hadn't never seen a man she wasn't related to. But in any case, they were determined to marry and Richardson never went back to the ship which I guess you could do. This wasn't the Royal Navy. This was just a, uh, a private whaling ship. And there wasn't much the captain can do with all the guns of the Presidio backing up Richardson. So they did marry and Richardson became a Mexican citizen and he was appointed first captain of the port of San Francisco of, of Yerba Buena. And that's where this picture comes in. Notice that's a spotting scope. That's what he used to, to spy, to see the ships coming in. And 
William and Maria, Maria built the first permanent house in San Francisco. In 1835, it was a, a two-story wooden structure on what's now Grant Street, not too far from our Greenbelt Alliance's offices. In 1838, he applied for a land grant. And a few years later, he was granted 19,500 acres in what's now Marin County and encompassed present day Marin Headlands and Muir Woods. So William and Maria moved to Sausalito. I'm guessing they had the first house in Sausalito too. And uh, as you can see Sausalito, at least at over 175 years, it's, reta it's retained its rural character. Not a Sunday afternoon, is it? One of the first things that Richardson did was to bring in Longhorn cattle from Mexico. I'm dropping in. And he grazed them in this valley. And this is where his vaqueros had their roundups. So it became known as Rodeo Valley or Rodeo Valley. That's how it got its name. And of course, Rodeo Lagoon. But one valley to the north, that's where Richardson did his hunting. It was known as Elk Valley. That was his favorite game, the Thule Elk. The beach was known as Indian Cove, the last surviving coast Miwok. Worked for Richardson on his rancho and they had their encampment by the beach. So kind of a bucolic lifestyle, at least until the gold rush. Of course, their gold rush changed everything. And there were three ways to get to California and the gold rush. Of course, you could come by covered wagon. You could board a sailing ship and go all the way around Cape Horn. But the third way was to board, was to board a, a side wheel steamer in New York and take that down to Panama to the East Coast disembark and make your way across the jungle, trying not to get yellow fever, which more often than not was uh, futile. But if you survived that, you boarded a steamer to take you up to San Francisco from the west coast of Panama. And that's where the SS Tennessee comes in. That was its job to take passengers from the west coast of Panama up to San Francisco. And the company that owned the uh, Tennessee, the Pacific Mail Company was feeling very good about themselves. They had just been awarded the US mail contract in 1853. So on a faithful day in early March, 550, the, the Tennessee took off from uh, Panama with 551 passenger and crew on board with some cargo and the US mail. And all went swimmingly until they got to the Fairlawn Islands. And then the fog rolled in. So the captain being the, the cautious sort, he put down anchor and he waited for the fog to lift. But as time went on, he got very nervous. He was afraid one of the other ships that were waiting out by the Fairlawns would make its way into to port. And how would that look? He had the US mail and he was too afraid to come in. So he lifted anchor and he, he started in what he thought was very cautiously in the heavy fog. But with the winds and the tides, he wasn't headed where he thought he was headed. And as the passengers sat down for breakfast on March 6th, the fog lifted a little bit and the lookout shouted, rocks ahead. And the lookout looked in the other direction and said, rocks behind, and they were doomed. The captain kept his head. He was able to kind of side straddle the boat onto a sandbar. And it hit the sandbar and beached at a, at a kind of a funny angle. So the ship's bell started to toll. And passengers panicked. They thought it was the bell of doom tolling their demise. And as the crewmen rushed to their duty stations, one lady jumped up from the breakfast table and she put her arms around the waist of a crewman and said, Oh, save me, save me. I can't swim, I'm sure to drown. And the crewman peeled her arms away and said, oh, relax lady, you're so fat, you'll float. Well, needless to say, the 
ship, the, the ship's uh, Yelp rating suffered grievously after that little incident. But one of the brave crewmen took a rope and he jumped into the water and swam to shore. And he fixed that line into the beach and they rigged up a, a breeches boy, which was kind of these little, this little rubber platform or pants you sit in and you slide down that rope to safety, kind of a, a 19th century version of zip lining. So they actually managed to get all 551 folks off the, uh, off the Tennessee. The crewmen had to hold the male passengers by gunpoint while they evacuated uh, the women and the babies first and the children, but eventually everyone got off. The cargo got off, the mail got off, and William Richardson rode to, uh, rode to safety. Well, rode to, to uh, the beach with um, supplies and tents and food. But before ships could come from San Francisco and, and pull the Tennessee off, the waves came up and, and pounded the, sh the ship to smithereens. So it was kind of lost to history, except that it, it gave its name to the valley and the beach, Tennessee Valley and Tennessee Beach. But every so often during a winter storm and a particularly high tide, pieces of the SS Tennessee appear on the beach. This was a, an outing that I think our last big storm year was 2017. And in November of 2017, we had a walk down to Tennessee Beach and we were greeted by pieces of the Tennessee as they were later identified by a, a park archeologist. So kind of interesting. So when we do our walks down to the beach, we start here at the, the Tennessee Valley Trailhead, generally more traffic than this. Tennessee Valley Trail is kind of like the equivalent of Nimitz Way in Tilden Park, very popular, but we get there early. A number of trails that uh, you can take that branch off from the main trail down to the beach, but we usually head on down to the beach. It's kind of a a fairly easy trail and most people have just had Thanksgiving dinner and uh, not in for anything strenuous, just trying to work off a few pounds. So we head down to the beach and after a mile or so, this uh, the, the ocean comes into view, but before the ocean, there looks like a, what's a, a, a pretty fair sized lake. It's not a natural lake, you can see the dam there but it has an interesting history. It was actually built by the last private landowner in Tennessee Valley. And that was a name you might be familiar with, E.F. Hutton, the investment broker. He owned the land and he built a, he built a dam to form a lake. He was a hunter and he planned to uh, plug wildlife, plug geese and, and ducks and shorebirds as they came in to, to settle on the water. Well, he seldom used the lake and now it's from what was originally intended as a, as a hunting pond is going to be a, a shorebird wildlife refuge, which is kind of a nice story. So we usually stop there and do a little bird watching and then head down to the beach. And this was one of the, the most iconic sites of that beach. It was known as the keyhole in the cliff, very photogenic. But if you look carefully, you might notice a, a little problem there. See, there's a fault that runs right, oops, runs right down the cliff through the keyhole down to the ground there. And one winter, not too long ago, the cliff collapsed. We weren't there, but there was somebody snapping pictures as, as the cliff came down and was washed out to sea. So that's what it looks like today. No more, uh, no more keyhole in the cliff. But if you're brave enough to walk over there, which we usually do, and take a look at the rock, very interesting. Looks like red, reddish brown ribbons. That's called CHERT, C-H-E-R-T. 
It's one of the Franciscan complex of rocks. Now, Muir, the Muir, Marin Headlands is like, to geologists, is like Muir Woods to botanists. It's the place that the Franciscan complex, which is our bedrock in the Bay Area, east of the, east of the San Andreas Fault. That's where it was first identified and, and described and mapped. Same rock over here in Tennessee Valley. And one of those Franciscan rocks is this chert. And it turns out that this rock is actually composed of the recrystallized skeletons of little planktonic animals, little critters called radiolarians. They live on top of the ocean. They look like, well, what Doris Sloan described them as amoebas and glass houses. They're gushy little guys that make their external skeletons out of silica, out of quartz. They live on top of the ocean. And when they die, those little skeletons, those little tests, slowly, slowly settle to the bottom of the sea, what Rachel Carson called the long snowfall of the sea. But over thousands and tens of thousands and hundred thousands of years, they accumulate on the ocean floor, a silicious ooze. And if the chemistry is just right, and the temperature is just right, very cold, and other conditions are right, they eventually lithify, and the rock they make is called shirt. So that's what you're looking at here. And the chert in the Tennessee Valley in Marin Heavens, it's been dated ranging in age, a little fossil assemblages of the radiolarians from 90 million to 190 million, Mesozoic age. So no dinosaur fossils in the Marin Heavens, but we have a rock that's made out of the recrystallized skeletons of little planktonic creatures that floated in Jurassic seas. Well, the wreck of the Tennessee was kind of the, uh, that was the last draw. It was, they had been debating a lighthouse for the Marin Headlands. And after that, Congress finally appropriated the money, $25,000 to acquire land and build a lighthouse. Well, they didn't have to spend any of the money on acquiring the land because William Richardson donated the land. And the lighthouse commissioners, they came out from back east and they picked the highest point they could find because that's what you did back east. You wanted to always put the lighthouse in the, the tallest little peninsula of land extending out to the ocean, which was called well, Point Bonita at, uh, in the Marin Headlands. So they built their tower 300 feet above sea level high tower, they used $7,000 of the money to buy a state-of-the-art lens a, called a Fresnel lens. It's hundreds of little prisms that they managed to get around Cape Horn without breaking a single one. They got it assembled. And on March 2nd, 1855, they lit the wick, the huge giant candle wick, burning whale oil for the first time. And even though it was just a, a wick and, and whale oil, that Fresnel lens was able to, to, to throw that light 20 miles out to sea. The Fresnel lens, the uh, little lenses are assembled in just such a way that it, uh, it bends and reflects, refracts the light and then sends it out in a beam, concentrated beam. And the lighthouse worked great all the way through May and all the way through June. Then came July. Remember, these guys were off from the East Coast and they hadn't figured on a, a San Francisco Bay phenomena. They didn't know about Carl the Fog. And in the Marin Headlands, the fog sits about 300 feet above the ocean, right where they had built the lighthouse, right up here. Well, that was embarrassing. Had a lighthouse you couldn't see because it was in the fog. So the Lighthouse Commission, well, they scratched their collective noggins and they came up with what they thought was a great idea, a fog signal. And the Marin Headlands had the first fog signal on the West Coast. Well, that sounds better than it actually was because all they did was hire 
an ex-gunnery officer named Edward Maloney. They told him to haul a cannon up next to the lighthouse and fire off that cannon every half hour once it got foggy. Now they only gave him the powder. They didn't give him any cannonballs. They weren't gonna risk that. But you can imagine what happened next. It got foggy for three days and three nights straight. And poor Sergeant Maloney had to stay up that whole time, firing off the cannon every half hour. He tried to get the lighthouse keeper to come down and help him. The lighthouse keeper carefully checked his job description. It did not say firing off a cannon. So he refused to help. Maloney stayed with it, but once the fog cleared, Maloney announced, I need a vacation. And he left and he never came back. And his next seven replacements quit too. So by the 1870s, it was decided a, a lighthouse up in the fog belt just wasn't going to do. And they decided to chop off the lighthouse tower and haul it down from right up here down to land's end where it could least be seen. Well, the first part of the job was easy. You could, they could easily build a road. There was plenty of room on the, uh, on the peninsula here. This side was all right, but right here they ran into a sheer cliff and they couldn't build a road. Well, first solution was to simply build this precarious looking bridge across the difficult part. You can imagine that wasn't very popular with the uh, workers. And when it came time to remove and transport the Fresnel lands, I think that's when they decided to build the tunnel. And that wasn't easy. 118 feet through solid basalt, solid volcanic rock. They couldn't use blasting powder because of the danger of landslides, only picks and shovels. But fortunately, back in the 1870s, if you needed a tunnel built in impossible conditions, you had a workforce with some experience. And we think it was Chinese workers who had toiled on the Transcontinental Railroad building tunnels in the Sierra Nevada that built our lighthouse tunnel in just a matter of a few weeks. So in 1877, the lighthouse had been moved and the light went on. And that's where it is to this day. But all was not smooth. In, you notice there's a, the road is washed out here. That happened around 1940, when on a dark and stormy, stormy night, one of the keepers was walking across the road and heard a strange noise and looked behind him. And the road was collapsing, even as he walked across the road. So he hurried up, he ran across to the lighthouse, he barely made it. And from then on, for the next few years, they had to use a breeches boy to um, get the keepers across. And then they built a, bro a rope bridge. But in the 1950s, they built this suspension bridge. So it turns out the Point Benita Lighthouse is the only lighthouse in the world that you reach by going through a tunnel and crossing a suspension bridge. And sometimes on our outings in the Marin Headlands, we get a, reserve a, a private tour of the lighthouse. So this is our group from a, a few years ago. Now, in the olden days, well, those of you who have already been on, on the tour, it has uh, public hours on, on the weekends in the afternoon. You know, the bridge itself was getting fairly decrepit by the uh, 2000s. But, and uh, there was a sign up there, it said five, five person live load limit. And then it went down to th three person live load limit. And then the Coast Guard put their foot down and told the Park Service to build a new bridge before we had another disaster. So there's a new bridge now and it's, it's nice and safe. Even if you tried, you couldn't get it swinging in the wind. And as you cross the bridge, if you look down, you can see the famous pillow basalt arch. And again, we, we don't have time to, to talk too much about the geology today. We do have geology walks once we get going again. But a lot of you might uh, see some poor frigid 
a poor frigid looking geology class out there at the Marin Headlands trying to sketch this. This is a very famous geology foot trip or field trip. And looks like it would be an easy task, but try doing that when in the, the wind's blowing 20 miles an hour. And that's it. That's our lighthouse today. That's the original top from 1855, and it looks it. That's the original Fresnel lens. Now there's electric light in there rather than the candle wick, but it's still doing its job. It was the last lighthouse on the West Coast to be automated in 1980. Sometimes, every so often, there'll be lighthouse festivals, open houses where you can go down and and, and visit the lighthouse and they open up the fog signal building, which is down below. That's still Coast Guard. And several years ago, we had that opportunity. We got to walk into the, um, the fog signal building and one of the great interpreters of the National Park Service was in the building, Roadkill Nancy, Nancy Valenti, who was also a Greenbelt Alliance outings leader for several years. And she was there showing everywhere, everybody her great collection of, of bones. I think this safety gear in the background is not necessarily for the Coast Guard. It was for chance encounters of Nancy that she tried to make you part of her collection. Well, I just wanted to talk about a couple of wildflowers. We'll be doing wildflower presentations in, in March and in April, but there's two wildflowers that are really worth mentioning now. One of them is this, you might recognize as a thistle. You might say, oh, what's so special about a thistle? There's many non-native thistles in the Bay Area. They're kind of a, a, a bane to hikers. They have sharp prickles on them and they, they really hurt to walk through, very unpleasant. But this happens to be a native thistle, one of our few surviving native thistles. It's called the cobweb thistle. And you see it on the way to the lighthouse after you pass through the tunnel. It's in a few other places in the Marin Headlands. Strangely enough, it's at the summit of Mount Diablo, which is also pillow basalt like the lighthouse. And you can see there's a, a, a native bumblebee pollinating our native thistle. The way it got its name, cobweb thistle, as the flower sprouts, buds out, it got these little filaments that look like a spider's web. Well, some of you may know that the thistle is the, uh, it's the native flower of Scotland, which sounds a bit strange. Why would the Scots have a flower that's all prickly? Well, maybe it's because they have prickly personalities, but no, that's not the reason. And to find out why, to figure out why, you have to go back 1,200 years or so to the time of the Viking invasions of the British Isles. And it was just on one such instance, the Viking army landed in Scotland and disembarked and the Scottish army raced out to, to defend their homeland. Apparently the, the Scots were using Australian mercenaries at the time, but the two armies set up on opposite sides of the field as night fell, ready to do battle the next day. Well, the Vikings decided they would make a sneak attack at night and catch the Scots unaware. So they took off their boots and began to tiptoe across, across the field. But the field was filled with thistle and their cries of pain and surprise alerted the Scots who drove the Vikings into the sea. So the thistle is the flower that saves Scotland. And that's our cobweb thistle. The other flower is quite common. Might recognize this, this is a lupin. There are scores of species of lupin, native lupin in the United States and California and many more in Europe. Very distinctive, it looks like a hand with its palmate leaves. And some lupins, they're referred to as sundial plants because unlike sunflowers where the flower follows the sun across the sky, the leaves actually follow the, the sun across the sky during the day with some species of lupins. 
But this is a special lupin. It's called the silver bush lupin. You can see how it got its name. And we'll go into it more on our, our wildflower presentations, but they have a very distinctive flower, uh, a banner and wings and a keel, usually pollinated by some of our native bees, heavy native bumblebees. But this particular thistle, this particular lupin is important, the silver bush lupin, because it's the host flower for the mission blue butterfly, an endangered species of butterfly. And as far as I know, the only places on earth that you'll find this butterfly, Monterra Mountain, San Bruno Mountain, and the Marin Headlands. So this is the plant that the butterfly lays its eggs on, that the caterpillar eats. Lupins have got kind of a, a checkered reputation through time. Um, lupin, lupinus, it's derived from wolf. And it had a bad reputation back in the day because people would see lupin growing where nothing else, else was growing. And they thought lupin, just like the wolf ravaging a, a herd of sheep, was ravaging the soil, preventing anything else from growing, near, growing nearby. But just like the wolf, lupin's role in, in nature and ecology was misunderstood. The lupin is actually a pioneer plant. It can grow where nothing else can grow and has little nitrogen fixing, fixing nodules on its roots. So it actually enriches the soil and paves the way for other plants. And you can see it's in the pea family. Here it's gone to seed, but it's not a survival food. Those little pods, the little seeds, they're full of alkaloid. So if you were to eat them, over time, they could do some significant brain damage. But back in England in medieval, medieval times, during times of famine, the peasants had no choice. They'd have to grind up the lupin seeds and make them into a gruel and, and eat the lupin. And the worst insult that you could give somebody back in the day in England was to call them a lupin eater. And remember the phrase going loopy? We don't use that too many, too much anymore, but that derives from the lupin. And the state flower of Texas is a species of lupin, the blue bonnet, which I guess explains a lot about Texas. But at least here in the Bay Area and in Marin County, the lupin gets the respect it deserves because there's a community named after this flower. This is a story told by one of our outings leaders, Terry Chaplin. And this, this community in the Marin Headlands, in the Marin County was being founded in 1908. The founder, Charles Wright, had, was ready to go with his papers uh, to file when his wife, Georgiana, asked Charles if they could name the community after her favorite flower. She was an amateur botanist. And Charles said, sure. Well, turns out Georgiana wasn't much of a botanist. Her favorite flower was the lupin, but she had misidentified it. She thought it was a larkspur. So larkspur is the town named after the lupin. Well, William Richardson died in the late 1850s, heavily in debt, as many of the early rancho owners were. And he couldn't hold the land. Maria couldn't hold the land. It passed to a man named Samuel Throckmorton. And this is, of course, there's a Throckmorton Street in Mill Valley. That's named after him. And this was about the time the Civil War was starting, 1861. And all of a sudden, the government became very interested in the Marin Headlands. They wanted to build a fort and set up a cannon. There were already cannons in Fort Point and Alcatraz, they could put one in the Marin Headlands, it would be a triangle of death for any Confederate raiding ship that had the temerity to sail into, sail into the bay. Well, Congress allocated $400,000, $100,000 for the land, $300,000 for the fort. But old Throckmorton here being the greedy sort, 
he wanted the entire $400,000 for the land. And the government and Throckmorton, they bickered all the way through the Civil War. In 1862, these guys passed through the California Geologic Survey. And William Brewer, who kept the diary, there's William Brewer in the rocking chair, they visited, he wrote down his impressions of the Marin Headlands. They must have visited on a particular foggy day. Here's what Brewer wrote. Same old California story. Everybody bought, nobody built. $400,000 asked of Uncle Sam for a fort and some land. The whole thing isn't worth $100. And that's why you seldom find any rich geologists. Well, eventually the cannon went in. It wasn't until 1870. But that ushered in a hundred year history of, Marine, of military occupation of the Marin Headlands and Tennessee Valley on the coast and inland, it was the domain of dairy ranching, mostly Portuguese dairy ranchers from the Azores. And for a time, the Marin Headlands was where most of the milk from San Francisco came from. And this is uh, the Fort Berry Chapel Right around World War I, Fort Berry was built in the Headlands. Of course, as I say, this was the chapel building. Now it's the um, visitor center. Across the street, these were the enlisted man's barracks in World War I, and now they're artist studios for, for the Headlands Center for the Arts. Down by the beach down by uh, Rodeo Beach is Fort Cronkite, not named after Walter, but that was a World War II um, era fort. And as you walk through the headlands on many of the trails, you pass by the remnants of some of the old gun batteries. There's all different generations of gun batteries from Spanish American War to World War I to World War II and up into Cold War. And on some of our walks there, this one was led by Kathy Petrick, who was a, a great ranger in the Marin Headlands for many years. Here we are pausing and Kathy is uh, telling us a bit about this old relic. All these old um, gun emplacements, these old forts are, are kept in a, a state of arrested decay, kind of like me. And Kathy will actually be leading um, our outing in two weeks over at Ring Mountain. And, Kathy is just a great outings leader. She was a great ranger and a great teacher. So you can sign up for that now. It's actually two weeks from today. And after that, not on the website yet, in February, we'll have another Berkeley walk by one of our board members, Bob Johnson, his Elmwood walk. And Bob's, Bob is another great outings leader and board member. And his are the most popular outings that we have. Anyway, on one of the walks that Kathy led in the Headlands, she got us a special tour of the Nike base. This was the last generation of, of uh, gun emplacements or of weapons. And for the younger generation, when I say Nike, you probably think of um, athletic apparel. But for some of us older people, Nike was, uh, Nike, Nikes were missiles. They were ground to air missiles during the 1950s and early 1960s. They were all through the United States around all the major cities. They were designed to knock down Russian bombers as they neared the coast. This was our last line of defense. And when they became obsolete in the late 1960s, they were all destroyed, dismantled. A few of the missiles were saved and one of the bases or one in the Marin Headlands, or one of the two in the Marin Headlands. And the surviving missiles were moved there and the base was kept as a historic museum. So the base is open to the public, usually in non-COVID times, usually once or two weekends uh, a month, we got a, a special tour again with our group. Quite interesting to walk through here. This would have got us all shot back in the day by at the entrance station. And 
during the open house days, they'll bring the missiles up from underground and they'll raise them kind of a, a bit of a scary forbidding sight to see. And everybody gets to go stand by the missile. They lower the missile. You put your hand on the missile. You get lowered into the bowels of the earth on the missile elevator. You hear a talk about how close we were to Armageddon. And of course, I always caution our, our Greenbelt people, please don't press any buttons down there. And they're usually pretty good about that. The mascot of the coastal artillery for all those hundred years was actually the Oozle Finch, kind of a mythical bird, kind of silly, except when the Nike people moved in, they really took it to new levels. This was their Oozle Finch. You can see those are the Russian bombers. It's grabbed in its talons. The Uzo finch flew backwards to keep dust out of its eyes. It flew at supersonic speeds, just like the Nike missiles. But it was really hard to add it to your life list if you were a birder, because if it, the Uzo finch saw anybody, it was so shy, it swallowed itself. And here's winner of the Miss Uzo finch pageant, 1962. And of course, that Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, the, the base in the Marin Head was on high alert. It's scary. So last day, we'll take a climb up to Hill 88, which is where the radar for the Nike Missile Base was located. Hill 88 doesn't stand for anything special. It was just a military designation, although Hill 88 is 800 and some feet above sea level. We usually start our walks down at Rodeo Beach. And we all get to sign our Green Belt Alliance waiver and hear about the organization. And here's a, the map, um, a map of, of the trail up to Hill 88. David and Serena on their wildflower walk usually all the way up to Hill 88 and, and down and back. On the walks I do looking at the rocks, sometimes they go on up and back the same way. Sometimes they really wimp out and do a shorter loop, depending how ornery the people or the dogs are. So the trail up is, is Really interesting. It's you know really scenic trail, but it's, it it uh, seems it goes from dirt through obviously a constructed trail to the old road that used to service the the radar station on top. And every so often you'll see a spot where the roads washed out, and then you're on the trail that had to be constructed in place of of the road. So this is. The road has slid. The geology here is really not conducive to, to building a, a homes. It's something called Franciscan Melage that we don't have time to talk about now, but it does not do well in rainy weather. This is not a place where you'd want to build a climate resilient community. Just put a pit on that in that for a little bit later. Sometimes you get to look down and see hey, quite a precarious view, not recommended if you have agoraphobia. But there's also spots to, to sit on a rock and just enjoy the view. And also great outcrops. Don't make eye contact with that guy unless you want to hear about the shirt again. But eventually you come to Battery Townsley, which was built in anticipation of World War II. And that's kind of notable because that was the highest elevation, largest gun in the entire country. They mounted this huge gun on there. It was 16, could fire 16 inch diameter shells that weighed 2,200 pounds, 30 miles out to sea. And kind of the analogy that we always used, that was the equivalent of firing an old Volkswagen Beetle automobile out to the Fairlawn Islands which would, really would have scared the Japanese Imperial Navy had they chosen to invade. I had a Volkswagen Beetle in college and it would not have made it out to the Fairlands without a tailwind. When they fired the gun, 
It rattled windows in San Francisco, very formidable. But after World War II, of course, it was obsolete. I believe the guns were sold as scrap, the cannons that were sold as scrap to the Gillette Razor Blade Company. And guess what use they were made, which they were. Made. And when the Park Service went in to, went up there to fill in the two uh, placements, one filled in with kind, the other one, the workers noticed was filled with water. It was evidently a crack underneath and a spring was filling the, the emplacement with water. And when they looked closer and looked into the water, they found little newts swimming in the pond. And that was the end of the plan to fill up to, uh, to concrete the, the gun emplacement. The, so the most formidable gun in the United States, the biggest, tallest gun, the, the bulwark of our, our coastal uh, defense was stormed and taken over by the humble Californian rough skin newt. So newts are a type of salamander. They live, spend much of their life on land in the summer and the fall, but when it begins to rain, they return to water to lay their eggs. And it's interesting, they go from rough skin to a smooth skin and, and a paddle-like tail once they're in their water. Here they are, return, you know. Here's the paddle tail, and this guy's developed the smooth skin. And they're, you know, quite innocuous looking critters. And you wonder, gee, what is their big defense? How come they all don't get gobbled up? I mean, they don't have any claws. They have little teeth, little pegs for teeth that can barely hold the little earthworms and such in. This guy looks like he's ready to upchuck. Why are they not eaten? Well, the secret is it's in their skin. If you disturb a, a newt or newt is frightened, this is called the unkin reflex. It bends up its neck, shows you its underside, raises its tail and shows you that orange underside. And remember, like the monarch butterfly, orange is one of nature's warning signals. It turns out the skin of a newt is poisonous. A California newt, well, if you chose to eat one of those, they're not poisonous to touch, but if you would, were foolhardy hardy enough to eat one, you would probably die. A rough, sti a rough skin newt, well, that would kill you about a, a 12 times over. And the poison is a nerve poison. It's called tetrodotoxin. And that might sound familiar. That's the same thing that's in Japanese in the puffer fish that you can order in some Japanese restaurants and recall they had to be prepared by the chef very carefully. That's because of the tetrodotoxin. There's some kinds of octopus, octopi that have the tetrodotoxin. I believe there's some mammals in Australia that have tetrodotoxin. And uh, biologists have often wondered how all these animals that don't seem to have much in common all developed, all evolved the same poison. Well, it turns out with the newt, they didn't, they didn't actually evolve it. What the newts have is a little bacteria living in their skin or on their skin. That bacteria produces the tetrodotoxin. So it's a great symbiotic relationship between the newt and the bacteria. The bacteria has a nice place to live and the newt is protected. Um, so, a guy walks into a bar with a, a newt on his shoulder, and the bartender looks at the, the fellow and says, gee, it's not, uh, not too often we get anybody here carrying a newt on their shoulder. Is that your pet? And the guy says, orders a beer and says, yes, this is my pet newt. And the bartender says, well, that's interesting. What's its name? And the patron looks at the uh, bartender and says, its name is Tiny. Tiny? That's a strange name. Why'd you name it Tiny? And the guy says, it's my newt. It was at this point that this guy got shoved off the cliff. 
outside Battery Townsley. Anyway, the uh, trail up, uh, that, that's the only new joke in existence, sorry. The trail up from Battery um, Townsley, well, again, it's partially on the, the road and every so often washed out and some interesting trail work. Finally, just as you get towards the top, the road reappears and a bit of a climb. There's a trail that branches off towards Tennessee Valley, but if you go all the way up to the top, you make it to Hill 88, which was the old radar station, as I mentioned, for the, for the Nike base. Again, there's some old buildings up there. I think these old platforms have finally been removed. They were so decrepit, but there is a, a great platform that offers a wonderful view. You can see Mount Diablo to the east, to the west, you can see the fair lines and, and way down the peninsula looking south. Kind of a, a great place to, to enjoy the view and to kind of contemplate what almost was here. By the, late 18, by the late 1960s, the military was getting ready to move out. The dairy ranchers had left, dairy ranching in the headlands had become unprofitable. And a real estate developer named Thomas Fruge became, became, began to acquire this land. He partnered with the Gulf and Western Land Company, a, a division of the oil company. And they came up with a plan to build a 26,000 person community here. There was some talk that Gulf and Western was also interested in offshore oil rights. Well, this they realized this would be none too popular with uh, the folks in Marin, with the populace. So this was kind of done hastily and in secret. Some of the supporting documents were rushed through and uh, really inadequate on their face, but they, they uh, slapped together a plan. They went before the Marine Board of Supervisors and without much debate or ado, the supervisors approved the plan, three to two, and Fruge went to work right away. Some of you who have been uh, old time residents might remember this, he began building um, this was the arch, the entrance arch for Marincello. This is at the Tennessee Valley, where the Tennessee Valley Trailhead is. And that was actually there to the 1980s. The, the Marincello Trail that branches off from here was a road that he had graded. You can see some of the flat places along the road that were graded for gas stations, and there's some exotic plannings that he did. Those freeway exits in, in um, Marin County, just north of the Golden Gate that don't seem to go anywhere. That was to service Marincello. But it was at that point that the citizenry became aroused. They figured, found out what was going on and they weren't happy. And the citizens began to mobilize and were able to interest some of the very influential people in Marin County. They were able to interest a law firm in San Francisco to take their case for free for, for pro bono. So they began to sue on the basis of, of inadequate uh, supporting documents and a defective plan. And one of the great, again, I think it was women that just like with the early Save the Bay movement that was, were in the forefront, one of them was named Catherine Frank Frankfurter. And this was a great, uh, great poster she had developed. And I don't know if you can read the little note on there. I think, oops, I, I think it's from Fruge. It says, this is no doubt, dear Catherine, this is no doubt libelous. Check with your attorney if you don't want to be sued. Well, Catherine gave him the proverbial middle finger and went ahead. And the lawsuits raged through the, the uh, mid sixties. Well, then the project got delayed. Fruge ran into financial trouble, so he started and he started to quarry with uh, Gulf and Western. Fruge had a heart attack that delayed the project, and then he died in 1969. And by that time, uh, Gulf and Western had had so much bad publicity, they were looking to get out of here, get out of the uh, deal with. Uh, at least something, but 
the attorneys for the uh, the environmentals, the plaintiffs said, well, you know, our clients are all passionate, passionate, uh, passionate conservationists. We're doing this for free. You can't possibly win. So Gulf and West sold the land to the Nature Conservancy. And from there, the Nature Conservancy transferred the land to the Park Service in 1972, just in time to become part of the Rin Headlands Golden Gate National National Recreation Area. So instead of this today, we have this. But it was a really close call. And those are the kind of battles that Greenbelt Alliance is, is helping to, to wage today, along with our partners and our great uh, volunteers. Jesse, you still there? I'm here. <laughs> Um, thanks so much for that very interesting presentation, Ken. I always love your jokes as well. <laughs> um, I wanted to give everyone a chance to just open it up for questions. If anyone has any, um, we'll, we're happy to answer them now. So if you have a question, you can pop it in the chat box or I think there's a Q&A function. Going once. Everybody's stupefied. <laughs> you just did such a great job of covering it, Ken. All right. Um, well, if there aren't any questions, then. Uh oh, we'll there's one. Yep. What was the project from Marincello? There's actually in the visitor center. There's a, a mock-up. It was it was really original. Was twenty six thousand. Homes. It was supposed to be uh, hotels and convention centers into the Tennessee Valley, and there's a huge mock-up there and 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 some and some interpretive displays about the project. So that was uh, that. That was uh, really one of the very first large-scale environmental victories in in the Bay Area in the 1960s. It kind of uh, set the the tone for for. It's where the environmentalists, environmentalists found their voice. Okay, and then Ronnie asked, um, is Greenbelt Alliance only active in the Bay Area, the Bay or all over California? Um, I'm happy to take that one. Uh, for the most part, we we only work in the Bay Area. Um, we're you know a pretty hyper local organization, so we work throughout the nine counties of the Bay Area. However, every now and then our work does kind of trickle to the state level, so. Um, and it looks like we have some in the Q and A uh, from Kathleen. What is the history of Green Gulch? Oh, gee, the Green Gulch that was built. We visited that once on an outing by the last landowner. Owner, man, owned some land there. Wheeler was his name, I, I think, and uh, built a little retreat there for his, I think it was for his wife who was very ill. And I think, I know it became a kind of a Zen center. We actually had a Greenbelt Alliance retreat there once, Jesse, it was before your time. And right off the top of my head, I, you know, it's been a while, I can't remember. But you can go hiking by there and it was built by that, the gentleman, originally built by that gentleman, um, Wheeler for his his uh, for his wife who I believe was dying of cancer. But you know it's a, it's a kind of a Zen retreat now. Cool. And there's a kind of kind of an organic farm there. Gotcha. Okay. Um, Kirk says thank you for the wonderful history, Ken. I heard once before read the speculation that Chinese laborers dug the lighthouse tunnel. Is there any archaeological evidence that might confirm this? No, there's not. It's been, it was in some of the books, and there's some, a counter argument that in the 1870s, jobs were hard to find. And if that needed to be done, that tunnel needed to be dug, the I Irish would have got first choice of that. So the alternate story is that the Irish did it, and it didn't take them weeks like it took the Chinese laborers, it took them months. 
And I used to tell that story. And Brian O'Neill, who used to be the park superintendent, did not like that. <laughs> and, you know, you know, there's a little jog in the middle of the tunnel. It could have been like the Transcontinental Railroad. The Chinese went one way and the Irish went the other, and they didn't quite meet in the middle. But yes, I, I don't, it it's, it's, makes a nice story that the Chinese built it, but we don't really, a lot of the records were destroyed in 1906. They were stored in San Francisco and they were destroyed in the fire after the earthquake. And there's an interesting story, the lighthouse keeper out of Point Benita watched San Francisco burn from the lighthouse. Okay, Claudia asks, uh, where is the visitor center that you referred to? It's a well, it's um, right off the main road. It's uh, you go down Bunker Road, which is not named for all the bunkers, believe it or not. And every all the roads are named for famous or notable artillery officers in the past. There was some man named Bunker. And so what's the road we turn up? It's Councilman, I think. It's the first main, major intersection. If you travel straight down the road, you end up at the beach. If you turn left, you end up right at the visitor center. It's the first thing you see on the right. Okay. Um, and Terry asked, how do you tell the cobweb thistle from all the others? Um, it's pretty, the only one you'd really confuse it with is the Venus thistle, which is also native. And I'm trying to, and they're very confusing. Well, the cobweb thistle, once you see it, it's very tall. It doesn't have too many prickles. The Venus thistle is the same, but without those cobwebs. But um, is that, that's our Terry with Greenbelt Alliance. I'll show you the next time when we, we see it together. But that's if, when you go, you have to, you'll probably have to go down to the Point Benita Lighthouse to take a look at it or to take a, a wildflower walk with uh, David and Serena. But once you see it, if you know thistle, you'll know that one. You'll say, oh, that's not the, uh, it's certainly not obnoxious like the star thistle or the Italian thistle. That's, that's real pretty. That's our native thistle. Um, and then Kirk asked, would you please repeat where the Point Bonita Lighthouse's special lens came from? Who manufactured it? Oh, it was a Fresnel lens. It's from France. That was state of the art back then. I think his name was Augustine Fresnel. And um, he came up, you know, back then it was just wicks burning lighthouse, burning, which didn't go very far that light. And he managed, it was a series of um, lenses that were assembled in just such a way that it reflected, refracted light and send it out in a flat beam and concentrated it. So that was like state of the art and everybody wanted those in the 1870s. And they're different sizes. Point Benita was um, not the biggest, it was class two. Point Reyes had class one, they got that a little earlier. Or, and you can go down there and see their huge lighthouse, but it's not in use anymore. They just turn it on for visitors. The Point Benita Fresnel lens is the only one that's still a working lighthouse. But there's brochures, if you go on the park, si park, um, the park website, they'll tell you about the Fresnel lens and you can Google it. But they're still in use today. In fact, that's the lens in your car headlight. It's a Fresnel lens. But it was Augustine Fresnel, a, a Frenchman. All right, I'm gonna take two more questions here um, as we're over time. Uh, Kirk also asked, um, do you happen to know the, the origin of the name Point Benita? Who named it and why Benita? Um, and regarding other local namesakes. Yeah, than... Point Benita, I'm sorry. Well, Point Benita I know was, um, it's not, not, not beautiful. Point Benita, it was named after the, the hats the, the Padres used to wear, the, the kind of the bonnets. And other names, well, we had Tennessee Valley and Elk Valley and Marin was supposedly named after a, a, a Native American. Uh, we'll ask Kathy in two weeks. But uh, yeah, Marin was one of, uh, like, like uh, Car uh, Chief Marin, I think, guided uh, people across the, the treacherous currents of the bay. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the last question is from Sue. Um, oh, well, one more, Sausalito is named, it's a corruption of little growth of willow trees. Oh. That's where that came from. 
And the original willow grove that Richardson built his house by, they, some of those trees survived until about 15, 20 years ago. They're all gone now, sorry. No, that's okay. Um, Sue asked, uh, how can I find out about the distance and elevation change of trails and also interested in the history of Mammal Center? Do you have any information on that? Well, the Marine, we had an outing there. The history, they have their own website. Okay. And we had an outing. And it's been rebuilt. That was the site, that was the second Nike missile base. Yeah. It was quite interesting when I worked there, it was a little you know, mom pop type thing, and you can get real close to the animals. And now, you know, it's a great interpretive center, but you can't get so close. Mm -hmm. But um, they, I believe, they have their own website with their history on there. And I'm so, what was the other question? Did Do you, you know, like the elevation gain on the trails at all? Oh, I think you'd have to. Um, I think you'd have to go onto the one of those uh, websites that. Uh, you know, all trails or something to get that. I know the trail that we use up to, uh, on the coastal trail, we're starting from sea level. And I think that thing is 840 feet. Okay. Uh, everything is under a thousand feet. Gotcha. And do you mention if there are any areas in, in the Marin Headlands that's good for whale watching? This is from Barbara. No, they usually, they love, um, occasionally they come by, you know, they like to, um, Point Reyes Peninsula is so much further out to the west, they have uh, better whale watching. Occasionally we get a few, occasionally dead ones wash up under the beach, which is, yeah, those, some, when I worked, yeah, Roadkill Nancy was on that one, would be on those like, uh, she'd tell you stories about pushing the, the dead whales in from Kirby Cove with my intern. Yeah. One time we had a shark come ashore, that was another fun thing. Wow. But occasionally we get the whale, we get whales, whale sightings, but the real place to go is Point Race. Okay. Just... okay. All right, and then lastly, um, we had a few people ask if there will be a recording of this outing. So I wanted to let everyone know that yes, there will be. Um, we will share the link in a follow-up email, which you can receive later today. Uh, also, if you're interested in signing up for more of our outings, you can find them on our website at greenbelt.org forward slash events. So check those out. Um, and if you enjoyed this outing, we really encourage you to um, give us feedback. Uh, in the email we're sending you later today, there will be um, two links to, do, to two different surveys. So please fill those out. It's important to us to hear from you so that we can adjust our communications to better meet um, your expectations. Uh, and with that, I think we'll go ahead and end. And thanks everyone who stayed longer for the question and answer session. We really appreciate it. Thank you.